We have two engineers. We have Elizabeth Vargas and Nick Roberts here to talk about the nanoscale. So the teeny tiny things, very teeny tiny. I'd like to remind everybody to keep quiet during the presentation. Keep your questions in your mind. We'll have a question and answer period following the presentation, and then there will be the after activities. But your neighbors may want to hear what's being said, so keep as quiet as you can be until our speakers are finished. So once again, this is the 10th year anniversary of Science Unwrapped. Our theme this year is the powers of 10, and right now we're looking at the nanoscale. So welcome to Elizabeth and Nick. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. We're really excited to be here, but just a fair warning. We are just a couple of engineers. You can see that normally engineers aren't um, invited to speak at Science Unwrapped. And so hopefully we will maintain the high standards of this great event that's put on by the College of Science here at Utah State University. So Dr. Roberts will start talking about his own research into nanoscale heat transfer. And he'll explain why, why he's interested in that and why you should all be interested in nanoscale heat transfer. And then he'll try to make the concept of nano a little more tangible. We'll then move on to a demonstration to also help us with that. And then I'll end by talking about some of my work in biomedical engineering using nanotechnology and specifically my work trying to understand the retina. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Roberts. I'm an assistant professor here at Utah State University in the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department. And me and my group, we study heat transfer at very, very small scales, so at the nanoscale. Um, and this is just a really small part of a greater field of study of nanoscale science and technology. And the reason we're interested in heat transfer at the nanoscale is because it has uh, pretty big implications for uh, electronics, so portable electronic devices where consumers are always demanding more better performing devices, longer lasting devices. Uh, the, the more power something uses, uh, the more performance, uh, performing capabilities it has, the more heat it generates. So it's really important that me and the other people in my research community in nanoscale heat transfer know, understand, and find ways to cool devices uh, like this. Um, another big area where my, my research applies is in transportation. Um, uh, uh, electric vehicles are somewhat limited in their adoption at this point because they rely on lithium-ion batteries, large lithium-ion battery systems that get hot. Um, so we're, our, our group is looking at ways to keep them cool, to extend their lifetime, as well as looking at other technology like wireless power transfer. So ways to dynamically charge your vehicle while it's driving down the road. Um, the last area, which is probably the most important, is energy. Um, we've been producing energy in basically the same way for a very long time. We, we, we heat something up, we boil water, we create steam, it turns a turbine, and that's how we generate power. Uh, so the work that our lab is doing in nanoscale heat transfer is, is trying to improve the efficiency of traditional power generation cycles as well as incorporate or improve the efficiency of alternative energy, so solar, wind, um, and things like that. So these are some of the application areas where nanoscale heat transfer and nanoscale science and technology are really focused on. Um, just to give you an idea of what we do specifically in our lab, uh, right here are some results of a simulation where we studied what happens to an electronic device in space if a heavy ion encounters that. So, if you look at the top left image, right in the bottom left hand corner we see a really hot spot. So an energetic heavy ion that exists in space has interacted with our silicon semiconductor device. It's generated a hot spot that's about 20 nanometers in diameter. And this hot spot, at least when the, uh, the ion strikes, is about 325 degrees C, which is above the operating temperature for most semiconductor devices. Okay? So our study showed kind of what temperatures we can reach 
when this kind of event occurs. But the good news is that as we go from left to right and then down and left to right, the whole series of images you see here occurred over the process of about 37 nanoseconds. And in 37 nanoseconds, we've reached a temperature at which the device will perform normally. Okay? So this information, this study that we did, helped electrical engineers who do devices in space, electronic devices in space, understand what the risks are when a heavy ion strikes one of their devices. Okay? So that's one of the studies we do. Um, Beyond simulation work, we also do some experimental work. And studying heat transfer at small scales means we need to make materials that have very small link scales. So this image on the left here uh, that you can see is a hierarchical uh, nanoparticle array. So the top image, you can see some larger particles that are about 500 nanometers in diameter. Then there's some small particles. The next image down is a zoomed in image where you start to see not just the small particle in between those two, but some other satellite particles that exist. And so we're getting nanoparticles that are about uh, 250 nanometers in diameter, 50 nanometers in diameter, and about five nanometers in diameter. And so what we're interested in is how heat moves around the particles as a function of their size. So the right hand image is a probe that we had to make in order to measure temperature at this scale. It's not very easy to measure temperature on the nanoscale, so we made a really, really sharp tip thermocouple. So it's like a really, really small thermometer that we could probe around these different nanoparticles and heat them up and see how they react. OK, enough about my research. I'm here to talk about nanoscale, not just what I do. Uh, and when I started thinking about what I wanted to say and how I wanted to kind of uh, introduce nanoscale to you if, you haven't been, if you're not familiar with that, uh, I was having a tough time, a really tough time, even though this is something I work on on a daily basis. Um, whenever I don't know anything, uh, whenever I'm trying to learn a little bit about something I don't understand, the first thing I do is I Google it. So I Googled Nano, and it took me to Wikipedia, uh, and I went to the Wikipedia page, and it basically said Nano is a prefix that is used to change the scale of something. Okay? So we're talking about powers of 10 in this series. Nano is 10 to the minus 9. I don't know about you, but that doesn't mean a whole lot to me. 10 to the minus 9. That sounds pretty small. So if I move over to the right on this image, it says it's 0 0.0000000001. That seems really small. Okay? In words, that's a billionth. One in a billion. I had a really tough time, even though this is something I work with, a really tough time figuring out what a billionth is. It's a very small number. OK. So again, my solution, I Google it. So I Googled a billion, a billionth, one in a billion. And it took me to an IMDb page for a movie that Netflix produced called One in a Billion. Um, I haven't seen it, so I don't know exactly what it's about. Probably not going to answer my question about Nano. Uh, but I read the synopsis, and uh, the premise of the movie is the country of India has a population of about 1.2 billion people, and they've never produced a basketball player that was good enough to get drafted in the NBA. Still not the answer I was looking for. Uh, but it got me thinking about the odds. What are the odds that a nation of 1.2 billion people have not produced a player who can play basketball at a level to get into the NBA. So thinking about odds, I started thinking, what's the least likely thing to happen to me? And I figured that was probably winning the lottery. So winning the lottery, the odds are about 1 in 300 million. 1 in 300 million, not very likely. But that's still 3.3 times greater than a billionth. So I'm more likely to win the lottery than to be a nano of something. So has anyone here won the lottery? Maybe one person, maybe? Someone won the lottery? Well, if you, if you didn't, you're not alone, obviously. Um, but you can probably appreciate the fact that you're not a nano of the population that's won the lottery. So keep trying, though. You, you might get it one day. Uh, all right, enough about nano. Uh, let's talk about the nano scale. Let's get into science. Uh, since nano is a prefix, we usually apply it to some unit of measure. Okay, in science, We've got a lot of different units of measure that are associated with different things. 
I like energy. I study heat transfer. Heat is energy. I think uh, Einstein changed the world when he said everything has energy. All matter has energy. Okay? When he said E equals MC squared. Okay? So the SI unit of energy is the joule. Does anyone know what a joule is? Anyone know what the definition of a joule is? Yes? I am not familiar with that definition of the Oh, a joule. Joule. OK. Different joule. That's, that's all right. That's all right. A joule is a unit of energy, it's not a rock, which does have energy, though. Um, but a joule is about the amount of energy it takes for me to pick this, uh, this bottle of water up and take a sip. OK, so not a whole lot of energy, right? Not a whole lot of energy. So it's a relatively small amount. So a nano of that is a billionth of that. So I looked up, what has energy on the scale of a nano joule, a one billionth of a joule? And the only thing I could find that was close to that was the mass energy of the Higgs boson. Anyone know what the Higgs boson is? A few people? Yeah? Good, good. So it was a particle that was um, hypothesized or theorized well, quite, a, quite a while ago by Higgs, um, but it was only recently confirmed in 2012. Okay? And this is the particle, it's an elementary particle that is in some ways responsible for matter as we know it. Right? So it is, the, it is responsible for the formation of some atomic particles. So protons are formed by these Higgs bosons. Okay? So it's a really small amount of energy. I don't know about you, but I wasn't quite satisfied with that picture. Okay? I still don't have a good idea of what a nano is or what a billionth is of something. Okay? So let's think about a different unit of measure. Let's think about mass. The SI unit of mass is the gram. Uh, any US bill, whether it's a $1 bill, a $100 bill, weighs about one gram. Right? So not very much. That's the SI unit of, of mass. Uh, so I was trying to think, what are the smallest things? What are the things that I can think of that have the least amount of mass? So I thought maybe a grain of salt, they're pretty small, a poppy seed, a grain of sugar. Those are all really small. So if we measure those at the nanoscale in nanograms, a grain of salt is still 58,000 nanograms. So it's huge on the nanoscale. The poppy seed, about 300,000 nanograms. The grain of sugar, 625,000 nanograms. So even these really, really small things that we can think about are huge on the nanoscale. OK. So I don't know about you, but I've got a little bit better picture of what nanoscale is. This one I like a lot. All right. So the SI unit for volume, which is the space in which something occupies, is the liter. Okay. The liter. And a, a, a grain of sand is about a nanoliter. Okay. So one grain of sand is one billionth of a liter. So if you want to visualize what a nano is, what a nano of something is, you can take this grain of sand and put it in your one liter Nalgene bottle. Okay? And so the space that that grain of sand is occupying is one billionth of that Nalgene bottle. Okay? Or in other words, I could put one billion grains of sand in my Nalgene bottle. So now I feel like, OK, maybe I got a better, a better grasp of what a nano is. But the best description of what nanoscale is came from Dr. Grace Hopper. So she was a PhD in mathematics, she was a computer scientist, and she was a rear admiral in the US Navy. And she described the nanosecond, which is the nano version of the SI unit of time, in a length. So she defined the nanosecond as the, as the length that light travels in a nanosecond, which is just under a foot, about 11.8 inches. So light, which is responsible for most of our communication devices, travels at the speed of 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. If it has to go to a satellite up in geostationary orbit, which is about 22,000 miles from the Earth's surface, we can calculate how many nanoseconds that would take to go up to the satellite and back. 
and it turns out it's about 239 million nanoseconds. A long time. And we take that for granted. That's very, very little time. It's about 2.39 seconds, right? Less than a quarter of a second. Okay. That's how long it takes. And that's why all our communication devices are so fast. But long story short, her definition of what nano means when she's talking about nanoseconds, I think was the best I've heard. So I'd like to thank Dr. Grace Hopper for that uh, contribution to the nanoscale world. The last one, which is something I deal with regularly, is the nanometer. So the SI unit for length is the meter. One billionth of that is a nanometer. And just this image right here, we can see the scale of things, starting in about five millimeters, which is the ant, so or some organic biological objects. We've got a human hair, which is about 10 to 50 microns, which is 10,000 to 50,000 nanometers, all the way down to red blood cells. And then if we want to be on the nanoscale with these objects, we're talking about DNA. We're talking about 2 to 12 nanometers in scale. If we're looking at inorganic materials, so these kind of material science oriented materials, carbon nanotubes have a diameter of about 2 nanometers. These are really, really tiny things. Okay. All right. Enough about nano. Enough about the nanoscale, the nano measure of things. Let's talk about how we make materials on the nanoscale. Now, part of my research involves making these things, so this is something I care about. And there's really two basic ways to make something on the nanoscale. The first way, which has been around a long time, is called a top-down approach. It's where you take big materials and you just smash them over and over again until what you're left with is nanoscale fragments, really small dust particles, basically that are on the nanoscale. The other approach is called the bottom up. And that's where you start with something very, very small like atoms. And you arrange them the way you want to to produce something uh, that, that you want, something that has some function at the nanoscale that you're interested in. Okay. So the top-down approach has been around for a while. This is just a demonstration of someone who's taken graphite, which is the same stuff that you write with in your pencils. You take that graphite, you add a lot of energy to smash it up, smash it into little pieces, add some other energy to change its form, and you get nanodiamond. Okay? Nanodiamond, it's not the same thing as diamond, but you know, it's got the same structure, just really small. People don't like it for jewelry because it kind of looks like graphite. Um, <laughs> but this technique has actually been around for a really long time, way longer than you probably could guess. It's been around since about AD 300. Okay, this bottom, this top-down approach of smashing things up. In Damascus, they used it to make steel swords where they smashed up nanoscale wire and tubes and incorporated it into their steel in order to make them stronger. Okay? Romans also used it with gold and silver nanoparticles to make this beautiful cup that looks kind of green on its own, but if you shine light through it, due to nanoscale effects, it changes its color and it starts to look kind of red or pink pretty cool, right? all due to the nanoparticles that exist in there. The bottom-up approach, right, taking atoms or small-scale pieces and kind of building something out of it, hasn't been around quite as long. One of the main reasons why is because it requires pretty expensive, sophisticated, and very precise instruments. Uh, we have some of those here at USU. The bottom left-hand corner is a technique that's known as electron beam lithography. And it's very similar to uh, what's used for the printing press. So we take a pattern and we transfer that pattern over. We just do it using electrons, use it using electron beam. The images that are on the top and on the right-hand side are something that's a little bit newer than that. We, it, it can be called electron or ion beam induced uh, deposition. And it's very, very similar to 3D printing but it's on the nanoscale. And with that, you can make any sort of three-dimensional object you can imagine, as long as it's in contact, similar to what you would uh, be limited by in 3D printing. But you can make some really cool structures. And these are mostly just for demonstration, more art than science. Uh, but they kind of demonstrate the capability of this technique. Uh, and this is stuff that we can do here at USU. We've got uh, facilities over in the, in the SUR building that, that, that can make some of these structures. OK, another important thing about nanoscale. One more important thing about nanoscale. If we make things, it's really important that we can measure them. If we can't measure something at the nanoscale, then we don't really know how small it is. 
And it's really important to do this, and you can't just use a light microscope. Okay? So many of you have probably used some sort of light microscope or a magnifying glass, something like that. Due to the wavelength of light that we see things at, we can't actually see nanoscale features. We can't do it. So we have to use specialized instruments, like some of the ones shown here that use electron beams or really, really sharp tips in order to, to uh, identify these structures. Okay. Uh, and so you may be asking, why should I care? Right? I introduced why I care, what nanoscale heat transfer does. But it turns out a lot of nanoscale products are working their way into consumer products. Um, one that you've probably used, hopefully you've used, is sunscreen. Nanoparticles have been put into sunscreen for quite a while. They're put into polishes. Uh, they've been used in electronic devices, so computer processing units, solar cells. Um, more recently, they're working their way into tools, batteries, um, protective equipment, sports equipment, and even pregnancy tests. So they're showing up kind of everywhere. And there's benefits to that. And so we're just going to take a few minutes to kind of demonstrate some of the benefit of nanoscale. Okay, so we're going to do a quick demonstration of the chemical reaction that happens when you add water to an Alka-Seltzer tablet. So in the first case, we'll have our press tablet, which will react with water and will create a little explosion in a film canister. And then we're going to smash another one up. So we're going to use that top-down approach to make our Alka-Seltzer tablet into a nanoscale form and then we'll repeat the reaction. We're going to time both of them. So you'll be able to see with your own eyes the benefit of nanoscale. It's not the great benefit, but it's a good, good benefit. OK, so I've got a, just a regular Alka-Seltzer tablet here. I'm going to drop it in the film canister. I'm going to put my safety glasses on. So I'm going to add some water, and then we're going to time how long it takes for this lid to pop off. Okay, we're going to have a little, little chemical reaction here. You ready? Three, two, one, go. Ten point four seconds. Now we're going to get our nano powder. Don't smash it up too much, otherwise it won't be able to get the lid on in time. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. This should speed things up a little bit. Hopefully not too much, because i got to be able to get the lid on. OK. You ready? Three, two, one, go. It took a I tried. We tried. <laughs> so apparently, our uh, our scientist was a was too strong and made too many of the nanoparticles. Um, but why do you think that happened? Why was the Alka Seltzer reaction with water slower when it was the big tablet compared to when it was smashed up? Surface area, okay. Any other explanations? Yeah. Sure. Exactly. So that's what the that's what surface area means. So we've increased the surface area because each of the nanoparticles or each of the particles of the Alka-Seltzer tablets are able to react with the water and that makes the reaction faster. 
even too fast for Dr. Roberts. And that's really, um, in case you just got here, I'm a biomedical engineer. And so I use nanotechnology to understand medicine and health. And so that's kind of the big idea behind using nanotechnology in medicine. Can we take advantage of these tiny particles to increase the surface area and make medicine and health potentially better? So does anybody have an idea of how nanotechnology is used in biomedical applications for, bio, for medicine or for, um, to, make, to help medical providers? Yes? Yeah. So again, like you, instead of having one huge tablet, you could have a lot of little tablets, and it could help people absorb that medicine faster, which make, make, could make it more effective. Yeah. Awesome. So have it targeted, to so have it hit specific areas. So you don't need the medicine going throughout your body if it's only affecting your kidneys. You just need it to go into your kidneys. Any other ideas? Okay, I don't know. Did all three of you see my slides? Because <laughs> all of you are the experts here. You already know nanoscience. You know nanotechnology. So that's, yes, all of those things to help it get through the blood-brain barrier because it's so small. So I'm going to start talking about a couple of these things. I'm sorry I didn't get to your uh, contribution. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about my own research into the retina. And so first we're going to talk about disease detection and probably the most commonly researched tool to detect disease better is nanoparticles. And they can be targeted. They are so small that they can get to places that are difficult to get to. Because of what we just saw with the Alka-Seltzer reaction, we can have a lot of nanoparticles attached to one huge micron-sized cell. And so we can do things like have the nanoparticles go to the places we want it to go to. We can also attach things like uh, a light onto the nanoparticles so that once it attaches to what we want it to, it starts to glow. So one disease that might benefit from nanoparticle-based detection is Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's is marked by this increase in amyloid plaques in the brain. And to be able to diagnose Alzheimer's, it would be nice to be able to see into the brain in, and to be able to see these amyloid plaques because the earlier we can detect them, the earlier we can diagnose Alzheimer's and the earlier any sort of treatments could be instituted. And hopefully bet the, the outcome will be better. And so Alzheimer's is a progressive neurodegenerative disorder. It affects the brain and the central nervous system. It causes dementia and loss of memory. And, but there are some techniques and some methods that could be used to prevent some of the worst case outcomes or at least prolong the most, most worst case outcomes. And so if we're able to detect these things earlier, that might help patients. And so what researchers have done is look at finding and developing targeted magnetic nanoparticles to attach to these amyloid plaques so that we can see them earlier and we can see them when they're really small before the Alzheimer's disease has progressed. And so what researchers have done is they've taken mice who have the genes that express Alzheimer's and therefore have the amyloid plaques in their brain. And they've taken targeted magnetic nanoparticles and they've injected the mice with these nanoparticles and then they have put the mice through an MRI. So they've done magnetic resonance imaging, which is a common technique to diagnose Alzheimer's in humans. And they saw that there are the areas that have the amyloid plaques really light up. And it's because they've been targeted by these magnetic nanoparticles. And the same areas don't light up if they just have, if they just did the MRI without introducing the magnetic nanoparticles first. And so big companies are, being, are getting involved in this. So Google has projects where they're interested in looking at disease detection. And the idea they pitch is something like this. So let's say there are some cancerous cells in the bloodstream. What you can do is take a pill that has targeted magnetic nanoparticles and they'll travel through your bloodstream and hopefully attach specifically to cancerous cells. Then using a wearable device that I guess would be a Fitbit or a, a Google Watch, all of the magnetic particles would then come close and be clustered near the wearable device and you could see whether or not those magnetic particles attach to cancerous cells. So again here, you don't see one nanoparticle to one cell, you see a bunch of nanoparticles to one cell. And so maybe we would be able to detect single cells or just a few cells at a time and really help the level of detection, just lower that, that level of detection so we could say really early on that 
the, a person might have cancer and we can start doing intervention therapy. So the other aspect of this was also mentioned and it's the idea of targeting specific cells that have the disease instead of giving the whole body the medicine. So one of the best I examples of this is with chemotherapy. When a person is given chemotherapy, it's given to their entire body and there's all these negative side effects in an effort to kill the cancerous cells. So there's hair loss, there's nausea, and a bunch of other horrible things that happen. So what if we could make a way to target these nanoparticles specifically to the cancerous cells and then deliver drugs into those cells and kill them right away? So here's an example of that. A, a group was able to make targeted nanoparticles and the outer coating of this contained drugs that would kill cancerous cells. And so there's an image on the right of this this is a, a melanoma, it's a skin cancer cell, and the nanoparticle up here has attached to it. There's only one because they didn't put in too many. And one nanoparticle attached to it, and the little red dots are drugs that are being released by the nanoparticle directly into the cell, which will then effectively kill the cell. So this is a targeted way to get cancer-killing drugs directly to cancer cells and cancer cells only. And there's um, some other research out there to make medicine more effective and less horrible for pe people to take. So if you have any sort of vision disease, most of the time you have to take, you have to have intravitreal injections, which are shots into your eye. And personally, I hope that that looks worse than it feels, but I would prefer to never have this happen to me. <laughs> and so what a pharmaceutical company is trying to do is develop nanoparticles that would come as eye drops. And so you would just have these pretty much a bolus of the drug that you're trying to deliver into the eye, and you'd have them in these eye drops, and you'd put them into your eye, and then they would get to the back of the eye, which would eliminate any sort of shots going into your eye. And I don't know about you, but if there are any sort of clinical trials for this, I'm going to sign up, because I would like this to become a reality. <laughs> okay, so I also focus on the eye, but I don't do work in drug delivery or disease detection. I use nanoscale engineering to build better models of the back of the eye so that we can understand what's happening normally and what happens in cases of disease. And so I specifically look at the retina and what the retina looks like is something like this. That's at the very back of our eye and it has some pretty distinct layers. It has our photoreceptors which are our cones and our rods and that allows us to see colors and shapes and distance and even depth perception and they're so specialized that they really don't do a lot to take care of themselves. So they need all these supportive layers underneath them. <coughs> and so one of those layers is the choroid, that's the blood vessels that go, that are in the eye. Um, and they're specifically for the retina, and so they, they give the, the retina oxygen, nutrients, and they take out all the waste. Then there's the RPE cell layer, those, they're the retinal pigmented epithelial cell layer, which are supportive of the eye and have these little microvilli over here that attach and communicate with the photoreceptors. They give the photoreceptors their nutrients, they t give them their oxygen, and they take out the waste of the photoreceptors. And then in between all that is a tiny little layer called Brux membrane. It doesn't have any cells in it, but it, it separates the photoreceptors and the RPE cells from the blood vessels underneath. So a lot of things can go wrong in the retina. The first thing that might happen is instead of the cells behaving properly um, due to age, due to exposure to sunlight, due to cigarette smoke exposure, e-cigarette smoke exposure, car fume exposure, things can go wrong in the back of the retina. Some of these cells can stop behaving properly. And things like drusen may form, which are these little calcified deposits, they're like little rocks. And so maybe the waste that was supposed to be transported all the way down to the blood supply is now literally getting swept under the rug. Or even worse things might happen, like um, blood vessels might start popping through the Brux membrane and popping through the back of the eye through the RPE cell layer and through the photoreceptors. These cases are called dry age-related macular degeneration and wet age-related macular degeneration, so dry and wet AMD. <coughs> and so I'm interested in seeing how these small changes that are, tot that are abnormal, how do they affect all the other layers involved? So with the drusen formation or the blood vessels coming in, the RPEs tend to stretch. And then in the worst case scenarios, this might be what an ophthalmologist sees, but there could be breaks in that RPE cell layer. So that RPE cell layer is that layer underneath the photoreceptors, and they might end up breaking. And these breaks are pretty big at 200 microns in size. 
And so what I try to do is figure out if I can use my nanoscale engineering to replicate this in our lab to see what goes on and who's involved. Because it's one of those horrible loops that maybe you get a little juice in formation, but then all these other bad things start to happen. Or if you have a break, what else is going on that's causing other bad things to happen that is affecting your vision? And the biggest bad guy in this whole process is, um, called, is a protein called vascular endothelial growth factor. It's VEGF, and it's the bad guy. But it doesn't start out as a bad guy, right? You've seen the movie. It starts out as a good guy. It's helping us in our blood vessels. It's making sure that all our blood vessels are forming properly. And when we have a wound, we want VEGF to be expressed. We want this protein to be there, because that means more blood vessels will go to the wound, and we'll get more oxygen and platelets. But if the VEGF level never goes back down, that's when we start having problems. And that's where more and more blood vessels can come into our eye and block our vision. So I start by looking for cells that are similar to human RPE cells, because I'm interested in focusing on that RPE cell layer for now. And so we found that pig RPE cells are similar enough to human RPE cells. And so we go up to Idaho to the butcher shop on Wednesdays, and we get fresh pig eyes, and we start growing them. And we look, and we see something like this, and we are so happy, and we find that it's so beautiful. And you may not agree with me, but here we have a cobblestone hexagonal bunch of cells, and they're all pigmented because they're RPE cells. And then, of course, we have to do a few more things to really make sure they are RPE cells. So we look at them really, really close. We zoom in on that with our scanning electron microscope. And then we find that cobblestone pattern again. And then we look at one cell at a time. And if you remember that microvilli, the little connections that were coming out of the RPEs and they were next to the photoreceptors, we can even see those. So at the top of this cell, in the fuzzy part, those are microvilli. They're 10 to 50 nanometers in diameter, and so they're tiny. But we're able to see them to make sure that we really are growing, our, we really are growing RPEs from the pig eyes that we got. And then we do some fluorescence imaging, and we look for the right amounts of proteins. And so we stain for different things, and we get beautiful pictures, and we make sure that the proteins are in the right places. So now we've verified that we have RPE cells and we can believe that we are actually working with them. And so now we want to verify the breaks because that seems like the most serious thing that could happen with your RPE layer. And so that's something where these RPEs were hanging out and they were all next to their neighbors and everything was great and then suddenly there was a tear. There was a break and they didn't have their neighbors anymore. And that seems pretty sudden. And so we wanted to be able to replicate that. And so we use nanoscale printing and we create this tiny piece of tape with holes in it that are 500 to 3,000 nanometers in diameter. And then we place that on a plastic, and then we grow the cells on them. And then we have these little patches. And so on the outside of these patches are cells that have no neighbors. And so to us, that's how we can mimic areas that are broken. So an area of RPE cells that used to be next to each other, and now they no longer have a neighbor or have a neighboring cell that they used to have a junction with. And so that's how we are able to replicate RPE breaks using nanoscale printing. And so again, we're looking for that bad guy, that overproduction. Does anybody remember the name of the protein that's the bad guy? VEGF. Yeah, that's right. I heard it somewhere over here. So it's the vascular endothelial growth factor. And that's the bad guy in vision disease. And so if you have a lot of VEGF, you might end up with having a lot more blood vessels come into your eye, which ends up blocking your vision. So when we, find, when we are able to produce these areas that have the breaks, we look in and we, we zoom in and we look only for VEGF. And what we find, if you look in the area that's closer to the break, that's the yellow line, those cells are producing way more VEGF than normal. The ones toward the middle, they're kind of blacked out, they have a light reddish hue. They're not producing that much, but the ones near the yellow line, they are. But that doesn't mean that's gonna, that blood vessels are going to form, so we do one more experiment where we look at endothelial cells, and those are the cells that make up your blood vessels, and we look to see if, if those, the, the cells that are, that are near the break, breaking edges, the breaking points, the edge points, if those are overexpressing VEGF enough to form blood vessels. So we take these endothelial cells, and if you put them into a liquid that has more VEGF than normal, they form things like clusters, and then they eventually form tubes, and they end up looking like blood vessels. And so we do that. We take our cells from that nice single layer where everybody has their neighbor and all those RPE cells are super happy, and we take the media, the liquid that these cells were growing in, from that normal layer and from the layer, from the patches of cells where there were a bunch of breaks and a bunch of cells that didn't have neighbors. And we put them into this blood vessel experiment. 
And when we put the cells grown from a normal from a normal RP layer where all their neighbors were, the cells don't really look that exciting. Maybe there are a few clusters. But when we look at the cells, when they're grown with media from the cells with breaks, there's a bunch of clusters and a bunch of tubes that are starting to form. So with all of this, we proved to ourselves that if you have a lot of cells, RPE cells that have now lost their neighbor and are, have now have faced breakage, they end up producing too much of the VEGF protein, that bad guy protein. And so, this, could, this is a problem because this is that endless loop of bad things happening in the eye. So with the healthy retina, there are a few things that can happen to cause an AMD diagnosis with the Drusen formation or blood vessels coming into the back of the eye. We have things like RPE breaks, which are pretty, which are easy to detect from an ophthalmologist's point of view. And we were able to verify that bad things happen in, uh, even after an RPE break might occur. But there's also RPE stretching, which is what we're doing right now. And like any good engineer, we want to also be able to mimic this. And so the first thing we did was go to a thrift store and buy an old sewing machine to be able to, to make tiny stretches on single layers of RPE cells. And so we're working on that now to see if <coughs> just stretching the cells will lead to an, a higher production of VEGF, leading to similar results like VEGF overproduction but in the areas that have been stretched, and, and then eventually blood vessel formation. So I'm not really sure what the future of nano might look like. It could be something like the nanites that are in the armor of the people from Wakanda. Or it could be something like the Star Trek replicator, right? But the thing is, those things already exist. So Dr. Roberts talked about it. There is nanotechnology in armor. There are carbon nanotubes that are already being used in armor to make them more bulletproof and more reusable. And there are 3D printers that can do soft and hard materials so that things can be replicated. And so with all that, I hope that we've tried to tell you that nanoscale engineering is exciting. At least the two of us are very excited about it. And we'd like to thank you all for coming. And uh, we'd like to thank, of course, our funding that makes it possible to do this research, and especially some of the equipment that Dr. Roberts mentioned is possible with these funding sources. And then we have specific research group members, and this is a picture of my lab, and Farhad's in the back, and he did a lot of the work with the retina, and Chase is here today, and she's gonna be taking over his project, and she also has a table that will be available um, after Science Unwrapped. And of course, we'd like to thank our family. And so if you haven't figured it out by now, me and Dr. Roberts are married, and we made two tiny children at some point. And so here's Alina on the right, and she's five now, and she was the assistant for the nanoparticles. And she's only 14 and a half centimeters in this ultrasound picture on the left. Um, and then there's Dylan, and he's one now, and he used to be 15 and a, and a half centimeters, but they were even smaller, right? So they were blastocysts at some point, which were 100 microns in size, with only 200 or 300 cells in them. And they had nanoscale sized organs. And even now, they're producing all these nanoscale interactions with their DNA and their proteins in their little cells. And so I hope that um, we've, maybe we've enlightened you and encouraged you to join us in this fight towards for nanotechnology. Um, but as they were developing and as engineers who are interested in nanotechnology, we were very excited. And now that they're here, we're even more excited to keep working on what we're working on to help energy, to help medicine. And we hope that smart and hardworking people like yourselves will also join us. And we'll, we're happy to take any questions now. Thank you. Yeah. One second. Hi, we ask you to stay for a few minutes and listen to the questions. Um, either Dr. Roberts or Dr. Vargas will repeat the question for, so everyone can hear. Uh, so the process requires quite a few steps. Um, one of the major steps is known as lithography. And so it's a process where you have a mask and a resist layer. 
and you expose them to light and then you develop it kind of like you would develop uh, a, pho a photograph um, and you do multiple steps like that and then you can form kind of the base structure after that, you usually do uh, an etch, a chemical etch process, which is what forms that kind of pyramid shape. Um, and then for us to form the, the, the temperature probe, we actually coated that with another dielectric material, so a non-conducting material. And then we just locally, with our focused ion beam, uh, etched that dielectric layer off the top. And so we have that exposed tip that's about 200 nanometers in diameter, um, and that is where the heat will go when we get close to a hot object and then we can measure that temperature. So that's the, the short answer. Yes? So a nanotube is usually made of carbon atoms. Um, Carbon is a really unique material, and a lot of material scientists are into it because it can have many different forms. Okay, we call that polymorphism. Um, the stable form of carbon at room temperature and ambient pressure is graphite. Okay, and this is something I like to talk about. Um, people think diamonds are forever. They're not. In a thousand years, it'll be graphite. But one of the other forms that's really interesting and is pretty stable is the carbon nanotube, which is kind of like one sheet of a graphite piece of material that's rolled up into a, into a tube. So they're very, very small in diameter. They have very strong covalent bonds, and they're great for reinforcing other materials to make armor or lightweight composite materials that are very strong. Yes? You want to take this one? So I've really been interested in understanding biology from like a different viewpoint for a really long time. And to be able to mimic some of the things that I want to to understand disease or understand even how normal cells work, I have to be able to manipulate materials at a really tiny, tiny level. And so that's why I had to become good at doing nanoscale things and both the top-down approach or the, yeah, the bottom-up approach to being able to build things at the nanoscale, but also being able to measure them. So using the right, tech, the right microscopes and the right instruments to be able to see things at the nanoscale level. So like the DNA and stuff, that's like bread and bones for somebody who's into biology. How much does Alina weigh? Oh, a nano way? Um, well, if it's a nanogram, it's one billionth of a gram. Uh, and there's not a whole lot of things that weigh that small. Um, let's see. The smallest thing I could think of that we could kind of visualize or hold was the, the grain of salt, which was about 58,000 nanograms. So I'm, there's smaller things than that, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure. The one over here. Um, what, do you ever have to deal with some atomic particles in your nano No, I don't, and I'm glad I don't. The oh, uh, the question was, do I ever have to deal with subatomic particles with nanoscale? And I'm not at quite at that level. <laughs> I deal, you know, my, my world of nano is still a large number of atoms. We're dealing with a large number of atoms, and so what's going on inside that atom is not something I'm concerned with usually. I think in the future, the next, uh, the next speakers for Science Unwrapped will start to address some of that. Yeah. Yeah, you got to go down the scale. So come back. <laughs> I saw some hands. Yes. So cancer cells on the outside have different proteins than normal cells, and that's usually how you can detect them when you do a biopsy. You do these different stains, and so most of the detection is based on antibodies, which are things that we talk about with antibiotics and with our normal immune system. 
but we can put just the antibodies on the outside of nanoparticles, and then they'll attach to specific cells. And so if you want it to be very targeted, you could put a bunch of different antibodies. You, you, don't just, you don't need to just put one. You could put three or four that would really just target this type of cancer cell. The question is how much is a oh, the question is how much is a nano diamond worth? Um, I, yeah, I don't know how many carrots that would be. <laughs> um, how much does it cost to make them? Well, using the bottom down, the top down approach, not a whole lot. You can make them with your if you have enough energy to add to it, and you smash up your your graphite from your pencil, you could make some. Uh, they're synthesized in labs quite often. Um, but they're not worth a whole lot compared to the jewel, the jewels <laughs> that are out there in diamond form. Um, it's hard to grow them at that scale usually, so they're not worth a whole lot. And they actually put them in um, uh, drill bits and things like that quite often now, just because they're very, very hard. I saw a hand, yes. I'll let you, you're the medicine one. Can a, the, the question is, can a nano hurt you? <coughs> I think at none of the, like a nanojoule or a nanogram, none of that can hurt you. <laughs> Stop drinking water. <laughs> uh, there, there are some risks associated with nano. Um, People working with nano powders, since they're so small, they can get dispersed in the air very quickly. Um, and it's, it's unknown how they'll uh, interact with your body. We don't know if our body can process them very well. Uh, so the students that work in my lab, my research assistants, um, make sure we do all the work with nano powders in a fume hood and we wear the appropriate protective equipment uh, to, to mitigate those risks. Um, that, those are somewhat unknowns. And actually, nanoparticles are being banned in some places for use in things like cosmetics and like face wash because it can't be properly getting, we can't get rid of it properly when we do water treatment. So it's ending up in our water supply and it's ending up in streams and in rivers. And so some nanoparticles can be bad. <laughs> are, th are there any other questions? <laughs> Yes. Do you have a question? How, how much I both weigh? What? How much do I both weigh? How much do eyeballs weigh? Um, where's Chase when you need her? <laughs> yeah, who actually goes to the butcher shop? <laughs> That's, I don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> um, a few grams, you know, so like, a, f a few stacks of dollar bills. That's how much an eyeball weighs. You didn't even listen to the answer. <laughs> do you have a question? I do. You already asked. Can you try again? <laughs> yes. No? No. So. Okay, I want everybody, if you would thank Dr. Vargas and Dr. Roberts here, thank our speakers. <laughs>